Hey everybody, this is Brandon Finnegan, Director of Elections here at Decision Desk HQ. Now, we've had quite the exciting primary season and it's still carrying through. I want to welcome you back to Decision Desk's coverage of the 2022 midterm elections. Now this week, we've got primaries in our nation's third and fourth largest states, Florida and New York, as well as senatorial runoff for the Republicans in Oklahoma. Now before we begin our channel, be sure to hit the like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell for new notifications when we release new previews and videos. Let's go ahead and get on to the elections. Now first up, Florida. Primaries, polls close 7 p.m. local time. Florida is divided between two time zones. There's a couple of counties in the panhandle that polls will close 8 p.m. Eastern time. So you kind of keep that in mind when you're watching statewide races. Certain statewide races are going to be blowouts. We already know that but they will not be callable until all of the state's polls have closed promptly at 8 p.m. One of those races that should be insta-called at 8 p.m. is going to be the race for U.S. Senate on the Democratic side for uh, Congresswoman Val Demings. She is a, an extraordinarily overwhelming favorite in that race. She will win it. In addition, the Republican incumbent Marco Rubio will win his primary easily as well. So, and of course, there's no doubts for the gubernatorial Republican primary. It's Ron DeSantis by a country mile. Let's move on to the races that are competitive, however. And we'll start with one of the biggest races that are going to happen this evening. That is the race for governor on the Democratic side. It's been a battle between Charlie Crist and Nikki Freed. Charlie Crist is a former Republican governor of Florida who then switched political parties, becoming an independent in 2010 to run against Marco Rubio for U.S. Senate, and then switched parties again to the Democratic Party in 2014, where he challenged incumbent Governor Scott, lost that election. Representative of the uh, St. Pete area right now had a good idea to run for governor anyway because he's being forced out through redistricting. His district now, which we're gonna to get to in a little bit, has become very, very Republican. So naturally he needs to leap into a different seat. In this case, he's gonna run for highest office again. Uh, there is a bit of an ideological divide between AG Commissioner Freed and Crist. Now, Freed is running to Crist's left and has drawn the most distinct divide in the primary on crime and policing. You know, Chris has kind of run on a real tough on crime campaign. Chris is from Pinellas County, Freed is from Broward County, so we should expect a regional divide in the race. However, as polling has gone on, while things have narrowed slightly, Chris is the very strong favorite in this contest. We do expect for there to be a decision to be made due to the number of Democratic voters who cast early and those votes being ca counted first in Florida. And considering the most Democratic areas of the state are outside of the panhandle, we do expect to have a definitive idea of what's going on in that contest by roughly 8 p.m. Eastern time. Let's move on to all the House races, all right? You've got uh, Florida 1 that's out in the panhandle. This is Matt Gates's district. Considered a bit of a controversial congressman, so of course he drew some primary opposition, but he's going to win that race handily. We've got the Florida 7 Republican primary. Now this is a newly drawn district. It's uh, voted for Donald Trump by about seven points. It's in the Orlando suburbs and red areas uh, out towards the coast. This is Stephanie Murphy, a Democrat. This is her old district, but she's retiring because of, well, how they redrew the district. It's a big battle between two wings of the very pro-Trump GOP. You've got Corey Mills, who's endorsed by Ted Cruz, Peter Thiel, Jim Jordan. And then you've got Anthony Sabatini, endorsed by Congressman Cawthorn, Gates, Gozar, and Marjorie Taylor Greene. A third candidate, Brady Duke, is an extreme underdog behind both of those candidates. Let's move on to the Florida's 10th Congressional District, the Democratic primary here. Val Demings has retired to run for Florida U.S. Senate. Uh, so the majority-minority Orlando-based district is left wide open. This is a solid D district for November. It is a moderate versus progressive proxy fight, if you will. Battle between Randolph Bracey and Maxwell Frost. Now, Frost is a community active activist running to the left of Bracey on pretty much every single issue, uh, most notably on the environment and criminal justice. Frost is endorsed by major national progressives, including U.S. Senators Ed Markey and Elizabeth Warren, and Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. Brady is a state senator that represents over 30% of Deming's current district, uh, probably favored a little bit because of his more local support versus Frost national support. Moving on to the Florida's 11th district, there is a Republican primary here that's of note. Incumbent Daniel Webster is being primaried by notable online conservative personality Laura Loomer. Loomer has been endorsed by Marjorie Taylor Greene and Paul Gosar, and Webster has been backed by pretty much everyone else in the Republican establishment in Florida. 
Moving on to the 13th district, this is the Republican primary race we should watch here. This is the newly drawn, voted for Trump by seven, Pinellas County District, redrawn so that much of St. Pete's most Democratic areas are sunk into the Florida 14th District across the bay. This was Charlie Crist's district. He's retiring, as I mentioned already, to run for governor here. Uh, the winner will face Democratic nominee Eric Lynn for the general election. Turning Point USA Hispanic director Anna Paulina Luna is endorsed by former President Donald Trump and is massively favored in this district. Moving on a little bit further down, you got the Florida 20th Democratic primary. Incumbent Sheila Trifullis McCormick is favored over Broward County Mayor Dale Holness in this black majority district. McCormick only defeated Holness by five votes last time, but is heavily favored over Holness this time around of the same kind of effect that we saw Chantel Brown and Brad Finstad with runaway wins when they had rematches. McCormick runs to Holness's left, especially on economic issues. Moving on to the 21st District, Florida Republican primary, incumbent Brian Mast in his Trump plus nine Port St. Lucie and North Palm Beach District faces a decently well-funded primary challenge from Melissa Martz, trying to claim that she's more Republican and pro-MAGA uh, than Mast, who himself is a big Trump loyalist. That kind of wraps up everything for Florida. Whole lot of races, whole lot of primaries, lots of interesting things. Let's kind of move on a little bit up north, all right? Way up north to the Empire State. That's right, it's time for New York's congressional primaries to look at. Let's start off with New York 1 out on Long Island. Now the district is narrowly pro-Biden, voted for Biden by 0.2%. Um, features the Blue Hamptons, Stony Brook, and Huntington versus a lot of uh, heavily traditionally uh, white blue collar towns uh, further towards its west. Now Trump did win this by 8% in 2016, so you could say from 2016 to 2020 it trended towards the left. Lee Zeldin, who is the current congressman, decided to leave this to run for governor, so it's an open district. Now, he did so because with redistricting initially, he was expected to get basically squeezed out of his seat, but that initial redistricting was thrown out of court, and he could have, if I guess he had decided to stay in place, he could have probably made a formidable run in November, but that's not what happened. Instead, we've got Michelle Bond and Nick LaLota. Both are pretty standard America First conservatives. Um, Lalota is already on the November ballot, by the way, because he won the Conservative Party nomination. It's important to remember that in the state of New York, you can actually run on multiple party lines. Let's kind of move on to a typical New York Republican primary. You've got Andrew Garbino, who faces a serious, well-funded primary challenge by a more America First kind of guy. Makes sense because he voted for the January 6th Commission and for certification. The southern end of Long Island, with a lot of Republican votes in East Islip and Massapequa, but still, Garbarino is very favored. That's why I kind of mean by a typical New York primary for Republicans. Typically, if an incumbent is facing a primary challenge in New York, they're going to win it easily. We do expect the same thing out of this district. It's a safe Republican seat in November. Let's move on a little bit further west to the third district on the Democratic primary. Tom Salzi retired uh, to basically try to run his, try his hand at running for governor, lost that battle, so now it's an open seat. It's a Biden plus eight district that includes small parts of Queens, Great Neck, Oyster Bay, and Republican voters out in Massapequa. It's a pretty intense primary between a few candidates. You've got the moderate Josh LaFazen, who's endorsed by Salzi. You've got Rob Zimmerman, who's endorsed by more of the establishment Democratic Party members, including former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, Congressman Steve Israel, and Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. Then you've got Melanie De Arrigo, endorsed by the Working Families Party and one-time gubernatorial candidate and progressive Anna Maria Arquilla. John Kamen is also a pretty moderate candidate, uh, very, very much into the salt deduction, probably a little bit to the left of LaFazen, but to the right of Zimmerman. The winner will face off against George Santos in the general in a lean Democratic race. Let's move even further over into Manhattan. Let's move into the biggest primary of the night, in my opinion, all right? That is the race for the Democrats in the 10th district. It is a crazy huge primary, lots of big personalities in it. Um, it is a big communities of interest clash district, and it should be really fun to watch. Massive media attention expected for this race. It's Brooklyn and lower Manhattan district. What do you expect? Uh, the district is about 18% Hispanic, Sunset Park, 23rd 23% Asian, Bay Ridge, and Chinatown. We've even got an Orthodox community in Borough Park. 
The majority of the district is classic upper income white neighborhoods in places like Park Slope, Cobble Hill, Tribeca, and the Village. Now the leading candidates in order of most progressive to more moderate, uh, Yuli Nu is DSA endorsed, BDS supporting big time progressive assemblywoman from Lower Manhattan, also received the Working Families endorsement. Her current uh, assembly district covers Chinatown, the Lower East Side of the Financial District. All, pretty much all of the local uh, office holders down there, New York City assemblymen and women alike in that territory have been kind of lining up behind of her. Then you've got Carlina Rivera, a progressive city councilwoman from East Village in Alphabet City, uh, a little bit more moderate on some issues than new, received also local support from local politicians, councilmen and women from that area or near that territory in New York City, especially progressives. Now, another progressive challenger, Mondari Jones. Either you consider that he voluntarily came down from Rockland and Westchester County trying to get into a more progressive district, or was forced out and forced to come into this by Sean Patrick Maloney. Maybe it's a mix of the two. We don't really know what quite was the big, biggest draw here for him, but let's move on to how he's going to be playing out here in this primary. People thought he would be doing better since he has loads of national support, but got very little local support. Uh, a progressive, but slightly, slightly less so than New Rivera. Then you got Dan Goldman. He's past U.S. attorney, the most moderate candidate in the race, still supports uh, general progressive causes like the Green New Deal. So he's a moderate for the area, but I wouldn't consider him much of a moderate on a national level. Just a moderate for Manhattan. There are a couple other candidates of note in the race. Probably the most interesting would be Elizabeth Holtzman, a past representative from the district and one-time U.S. senatorial candidate in 1980. That shows you how long ago she was a congresswoman from this district. A lot of people jumping into this race, though. Everyone trying their shot as an open contest. It's a ridiculously crowded primary. The bottom line of this race, I would expect either New or Rivera to be the favorite. Uh, Goldman has been doing well in polling, so we'll just kind of see how things shape out. Definitely worth the wait. It's definitely worth the watch on election night. Uh, let's move on a little bit further uh, to the south and west. You've got the Staten Island Coastal Brooklyn District, uh, New York 11, Democratic primary here. Now, this is a likely R race given that it was a Trump plus eight seat. Uh, you know, we do expect the Republican incumbent to win in November, at least based on our modeling, but it still could be potentially close. Max Rose, a former congressman for this district, uh, or most of this district, including the entirety of Staten Island, um, actually faces a primary challenge to his left by Brittany Ramos de Barros. She's raised about $700,000. Rose is still expected to pull this out, but it could be an interesting race to watch. Now, here is another high profile. This is probably the biggest race in terms of member on member we've seen nearly all year. Congressman Jerry Nadler versus Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney. Both are longtime incumbents for the Upper East and Upper West Sides and were double bunked into a single district. The race should be very close and ridiculously polarized based on the two's prior districts. There's no ideological divide between the two per se. It's just going to be a real long slog between who pulls it out, whose base in this district that now kind of combines their old territory, who's got the stronger base. And that's what there is a major third election. candidate, by the way. Siraj Patel is running as a pr pr pragmatic progressive, in his own words. Uh, frankly, he's just much, much younger than the two uh, seasoned incumbent Congress folk. He will pull some of the vote because of his youth and because of his progressive angle, but we do, of course, expect one of the incumbent Congress folk to win. In the primary for New York 16, on the Democratic side, incumbent Jamal Bowen faces a serious primary challenge from the center in his new Westchester County-based district from Vidat Gashi. Bowen got pushed north in this new map, and since New York lost a district, we'll have to see how he performs in this new district, featuring a lot more affluent voters. Um, he will still probably pull things out. I do expect him to do very, very well in Mount Vernon and Yonkers in his base. Probably enough to push into victory, but we'll have to see. Speaking of Sean Patrick Maloney, I mentioned him a little earlier. He is running again in the New York 17th District. This is a Biden plus thin district. Um, Sean Patrick Maloney is a strong favorite in the November election. A lot of that is based on the fact that he's got an enormous stash of cash here for running for re-election. 
Uh, he is heavily favored over Alessandra Biaggi in his new district. This is the dairy district that Mondary Jones is leaving. Uh, the northern portion of Ro Westchester County includes parts of Rockland County. Uh, Putman and Dutchess County portions of the district are pretty small and very right-leaning, so we don't expect them to play a huge role in the primary. Sean Patrick Maloney should dominate in Rockland and could be slightly more vulnerable in the Westchester County any portion. We'll just have to see. In the 18th district, Sean Patrick Maloney could have run for this instead of forcing Jones out, but uh, he seemed like he decided to run in more familiar, more comfortable turf. This is a slightly more Republican district than New York 17. It voted for Biden by eight points, features Newborough and Pekopsky versus Pink Rurals. Uh, we have this race as a potentially exciting one in November. Pat Ryan is hugely favored in the Democratic primary. He is also running simultaneously in the New York 19th special election against Malinaro the same night. The New Lines New York 19th Democratic primary features a battle between Jamie Cheney and Josh Riley. Should be a decently competitive matchup in this D plus five district. They're both well-funded. They're similar uh, in ideology, you know, typical progressive candidates. Winner will face off against Mark Malarano and the new New York 19. He may achieve incumbency status, by the way, Molinaro may, by beating Ryan in the special election. We have this as a prefer our district in November, but we'll have to see how things shake up. Now let's talk about the old lines, by the way, New York 19th district, because there is a special general election uh, during this primary, there's a special general election under the old lines for the New York 19th District. It's going to feature Democrat Pat Ryan versus Republican Mark Molinaro. The district is left open because former Congressman Anthony Delgado vacated this district to become Hosh Governor Hochul's new Lieutenant Governor. Uh, it voted for Delgado by a decent margin in 2020 and, the, and 2018. But uh, that district's been completely blown up with the new map, all right? 2% of the, of the old lines are now in New York 17, 32% New York 18, 47% New York 19, 19% in New York 21. It basically was broken in every different direction. This is a marginally Biden district, voted for Biden by 1.5 points in 2020. Um, after recent elections that we've seen in Minnesota 1, in uh, Kansas, in Nebraska earlier this year. We do expect there to be a lot of tension on this race. Democrats are probably going to gain most of their votes out of Ulster County up in the Catskills. This is where Pat Ryan is a county executive. Now Mark Molinaro is a Dutchess County executive and that'll be a key county in the race for him. And we're just going to have to see how things shake out over there. We're coming into the home stretch of New York congressional districts, going around through the 22nd congressional district, Republican primary. This is John Kafko's old district. He's retiring after voting to impeach Trump. Now, this voted for Biden by about seven points. Syracuse and Utica anchor the blue areas and they run against the red rurals. We have this race as a toss up in November. For the Republican primary, you've got Brandon Williams, Steve Wells. They're both conservative candidates, not particularly interested in talking about Trump, but typical pre-Trump conservatism in upstate New York. We'll have to see who pulls it out in this primary. There is also another special election, the Old Lines New York 23 special. And incumbent Republican Tom Reed resigned early after being accused of sexual misconduct, so there is now a special election for the seat. Reed also voted for the January 6th commission and bashed Trump in public statements. So this is a second instance of a more moderate Republican shooting themselves in the foot after the Van Taylor fiasco that some of you might remember back in March. Moderate Reed ally Joe Simpolinski is the Republican nominee for this seat and should cruise, should cruise, in this special election. The district voted for Trump by about 11 points. Uh, there would be huge alarm bells for the Republicans if this turned out to be a close race on Tuesday. In the regular or shall we say new lines, New York 23, Republican primary. Simpolinski isn't running for this full term because he thought fellow moderate upstate Republican ally Chris Jacobs was probably gonna grab the seat. But Jacobs retired after only two years in the Republican caucus after voting for the January 6th commission and for the AR-15 ban, leaving the seat to the more MAGA wing of the Republican party. That brings us to Carl Palladino and Nick Langworthy. Now, they've been engaged in a pretty nasty primary filled with tons of name calling and a battle for who's more loyal and more devoted to former President Donald Trump. I do expect this to be a very close primary race and a race to watch on Tuesday night. 
that wraps things up for us in the Empire State, but we still have one more state left to go, and we don't want to overlook this. This is the Oklahoma U.S. Senate Special Republican Primary runoff election. This features former Speaker of the Oklahoma House of Representatives T.W. Shannon taking on current Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen. Now, Mark Wayne Mullen won the first round 44% to 18%. He is a huge favorite over Shannon to win the runoff in the seat. Uh, Mullen is a member of the Cherokee Nation and wins by ridiculous margins in his uh, district, which is Oklahoma's 2nd Congressional District in the eastern part of the state. For Shannon to become competitive with Mullen, he will have to win dominating margins in Oklahoma and Cleveland counties. So those are the two big counties you're going to want to watch for the night if Mullen is actually trailing Shannon in both by large margins. Maybe it becomes close. We'll just have to see how things play out. Now that'll wrap things up for us here at Decision Desk. It was a huge preview for all these exciting primaries on, on congressional level and uh, some the senatorial level for this week, August 23rd. Until our next preview, which will be for the state of Massachusetts, I'm Brandon Finnegan, Director of Elections here at Decision Desk HQ, reminding to like and subscribe. Thank you for watching this video, and we'll see you again soon.